So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry for this delay. And welcome to the Charles David Keeling Lecture. I'm Atul Jain. I'm a professor in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Illinois. Thank you for joining us today. Now, before I introduce our today's speaker, I would like to give you a little background about the Keeling Lecture. This event is named after Charles Dave Keeling, a 1948 University of Illinois graduate from the Department of Chemistry. Dr. Keeling was the first one to make extremely precise measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide, the most important greenhouse gas. His measurements clearly indicated that the atmospheric CO2 concentrations were and still are increasing, leading to the recognition that human activities could have a significant impact on the Earth's climate system. His produced data set is now widely known as the Keeling curve, and his measurements are renowned as the single most important environmental data set taken in the 20th century. After receiving his PhD in chemistry from Northwestern in 1954, Keeling spent most of his career uh, at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego, until his death in 2005. Each year, a collaboration between the academic units on campus results in the lecture on climate to honor Keeling's legacy. This year's lecture is co-sponsored by the Department of Atmospheric Sciences and the Institute of Sustainability, Energy and Environmental, or ISIS. And our today's lecturer is Dr. Manvinder Dube, a very special or distinguished speaker from Los Alamos National Laboratory. Dr. Dube's work combines measurements of greenhouse gases and aerosols and computer model calculations to improve projections of the carbon cycle, which deals with the carbon dioxide climate change, as well as the air quality models for the implementation of decarbonization policies. Dr. Dubey has earned numerous honors and awards, including Los Alamos National Lab Fellows Outstanding Research Prize and awarded as AAAS um, Los Alamos National Lab and Fulbright Fellows. He did his PhD at Harvard. I have recently learned that Dr. Dube was a classmate of University of California, San Diego's professor, Ralph Keeling, son of Charles Dave Keeling, and actively collaborated with him as well as his father, Charles Dave Keeling, on carbon cycle science. Today, Dr. Dubey will be sharing with his um, with us his expert opinion on greenhouse gases as observed during the past, present, and in the future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Manvendra Dubey. Dr. Dubey, the Zoom link is yours now. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's glad to be not commuting, uh, reducing our carbon footprint, doing virtually. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to give the 2023 Keeling Lecture today. Uh, I spent some time with Dr. Charles Keeling discussing decarbonization at scale at the 2005 AGU Chapman Conference on the Science and Technology of Carbon Sequestration in San Diego, California. So I can't help but reminisce that uh, those conversations I had and the carbon sequestration field has advanced significantly and we are in an early stage implementation now. And Dr. Keeling would be very happy to note this uh, progress. My talk today will highlight the perspectives of observations to underscore the magnitude of the climate change problem. I'm an observationalist uh, and also I uh, am committed to refining models. Uh, let me go on. Let's see, how do I move forward? Okay, here we go. So as an observationalist, uh, uh, the left plot here shows that the energy balance of the earth and how we are changing it. So you can see there's about 340 watt per meter square uh, solar radiation that we inter intercept. Uh, there are greenhouse gases already, there were, but the anthropogenic increase has contributed to an additional uh, infrared absorption of about three watt per meter square. 
We also have polluted the air by aerosols that scatter sunlight and affect clouds. And that has uh, reflected by, uh, uh, back about one watt per meter square. Uh, so I think uh, we know pretty well uh, what the forcing functions are. Uh, there are some uncertainty aerosols. And based on these measurements, we can also check the radiative balance, measure it from space. And you can see that uh, both in the reflected and emitted uh, uh, the, the radiation from the Earth uh, as monitored by satellites. So uh, just to uh, summarize, our complex climate system has trapped, based on measurements, about 400 zettajoules of energy. And the system has, that the research shown, has a lot of positive feedbacks. Uh, that some negative, but mostly positive. And regions are changing at unprecedented rates and some crossing thresholds. And business as usual will, if you project it right, knowing the past, can head us to 8.5 watt per meter square. So you're sitting at two watt per meter square if you take the aerosol occluding, but we're headed to eight and a half watt per between business as usual. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's measurable warming, predictable response to greenhouse gases, uh, and that, that is kind of uh, the legacy of uh, Dr. Keeling. Uh, my outline of the talk today is structured chronologically. Uh, what I do want to take a historic look at the atmospheric CO2, other greenhouse gases, climate change, including stratospheric ozone effects, uh, uh, and uh, albeit updated with, uh, with current data and, uh, and also um, uh, look to the future. So uh, in 55, before uh, Keeling started his measurements, he actually did the first precise manometric measurements of cryogenic samples. Uh, he followed with the continuous surface observations uh, in 57 that continue to today and, and are taken over by his son, Ralph. Uh, I think in 1970s, there was an expansion by NOAA and other uh, worldwide uh, agencies to expand the network globally and to extend it to other trace gases. I do wanna inject something is parallel to science. There are other agreements and, and actions and Montreal Protocol to control the uh, ozone depleting substances like halocarbons was signed in 87. Uh, modern techniques uh, that expanded the scale of the uh, measurement enterprise uh, began in 2004 with this total column carbon observing network I'll talk about. Uh, there's an era of quantitating satellite observations that's blossoming uh, and data is coming because it's tied to ground base stations. I will then talk a little bit about my research and my team's research, both at Four Corners, um, looking at power plant emissions, uh, if I have time, and methane hotspot discovery there. I will also discuss some results we uh, have in Manaus, Brazil, on the Amazon carbon cycle that continues to be an undersampled region uh, 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 of the world. Uh, I will then uh, get to the Paris Agreement and the needs for uh, in intended nationally determined contributions, baselining and, uh, and global stockpile. And then finally, I will try to look in the future, coming back to what Keeling, uh, my conversations with Dr. Keeling in, in 2005. This is a historic talk, so I think it's as much uh, a dedication to Dr. Keeling's work, uh, who has inspired many of us. And here uh, uh, I kind of articulate, uh, 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 quoted here are Keeling's reflections on his quest to make sense of published CO2 observations. And you can see on the right is uh, the, before uh, you know, 1900 or even to 1950, uh, the measurements ranged from 200 to 600 uh, parts per million and were all over. Uh, and Keeling actually recognized that, and that inspired him to really make precise measurements. And I'm reading uh, from his uh, article in, uh, in 1998, he's reminiscing on his work. And I'll let me just read, uh, CO2 concentrations varied significantly, he was at Caltech, as Pasadena's air was affected by CO2 emissions from industry and powers. So you can see the variability on the top uh, in the past was all where you were measured. Okay, he was making precise measurement, it also mattered where you measure. So he turned his sampling to the Big Sur, where, which is clean and remote. And, and uh, there he discovered that air at night was higher than during the day. So here he is uh, understanding the boundary layer height, which is shallow in the night. And during the day, it increases. And now that air brings in free tropospheric ash. Uh, also, he was an expert in isotope analysis. And he saw 13 CO2 was depleted. That is signature of plants and soils. Uh, and the diurnal patterns, he didn't confine himself to, uh, to this region, but as shown here, he went to many forests, rainforests and mountain forests, 
And what he concluded uh, even before he started his network is the air in the afternoon always had the same amount of CO2, about 310 parts per million. And the highly uh, variable literature values for CO2 in the, in the free atmosphere were not correct or, or rather were taken in a very, uh, very uh, 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 complex environment. Uh, and again, uh, just to note that his measurements were very painstaking and accurate. Uh, and these were flash samples where, uh, you know, his love for the outdoors uh, with the precise measurements contributed to this, uh, 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 you know, very high impact discovery. Uh, starting in 1958, based on these grab samples, he actually decided to uh, make a push for continuous measurements. At that time, and even today, he was very savvy and aware of what instruments were out there. And a long-lasting technique uh, is light absorption. And so CO2 absorbs in the uh, infrared at 4.26 microns. So uh, Applied Physics Corpor Corporation uh, had developed instruments for defense applications uh, that measured high CO2 continuously using these techniques. It had a long path length of about 16 inch. So you can see the, 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 the instrument on the left is pretty bulky. And so he deployed this, uh, I think he got four of these and he deployed one at Mauna Loa. And here I'm just showing you the first results published uh, on the top from 1957 to 60. And what you clearly see is obviously it's about 310 parts per million, but there is a seasonal cycle which is the plants uh, taking up CO2 during the warm summer, sunlit summer, and releasing CO2 during the winter. And this diurnal cycle uh, uh, persists. Uh, the second he discovered over longer time periods is uh, from 1950 for a decade. You can see uh, there is actually a clear anthropogenic trend. And then uh, finally, which was also more important, is that he discovered that then there, when there are decadal variability due to El Nino, La Nina, natural patterns, a CO2 responds because uh, via, via temperature, fires, et cetera. So I think, uh, I think these three uh, findings, even before our field uh, uh, you know, got started deep, uh, are, are the foundations of, uh, of modern carbon cycle science. Uh, I do want to highlight that the latest IPC CAR 6 uh, 2021 report does a very good job in capturing in one busy cartoon the history and the contributors uh, to uh, climate science uh, from the 1800s to now. And prominent among them is, uh, is uh, Dr. Keeling's uh, measurements in 1957. Uh, and shown here is this Keeling, cry, uh, Keeling curve. Uh, and the question before uh, Dr. Keeling's work was, do fossil energy CO2 uh, does accumulate in the air? That question is definitively answered. Uh, they accumulate and they, they rise. And in many of these luminaries uh, listed here are novelists. And it's, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Keeling was recognized with the National Medal of Science, uh, uh, very, uh, very worthy of that honor. Let me now come to the modern uh, plots and modern records. And this is... Uh, the summary of the precise remote CO2 observations that proved its increase from humanity. Uh, what you can see is that uh, CO2 rose from about 313 parts per million in the 1957 to now it's about 420 parts per million. It's more than 50% over pre-industrial levels. It used to be 12%. Uh, also uh, apparent here in these trends is that the CO2 rise was only about 0.7 ppm per year in the first uh, 60s decade. And in the last decade, that rise is, uh, is more like 2.4 uh, parts per million per year. So uh, uh, the fossil fuel emissions from inventories have increased by a factor of almost five, whereas the land use contribution has actually uh, dropped by about 40% since 1957. So you can see the anthropogenic activity has changed a lot. We're fossil dominated, whereas in the past, we, were, uh, we, were, we had a little bit more contribution from land use change. So uh, this is the Mauna Loa record on the, sea, on the left. And you can also see this seasonal cycle. Clearly the, the trends are, as I showed you early on over the few years, he couldn't discern the trend from variability of the seasonal cycle. Now there is no doubt. Uh, he also expanded uh, the seasonal cycles vary with, with latitude. Uh, higher latitudes have more temperature changes with the season and sunlight changes. So that contrast uh, becomes clearer. I'll talk a little bit about it. But he, he actually expanded and Scripps has expanded its network to span the whole globe from north to south. And you can see all these sites where data is collected and available right from Antarctica to, to, to the uh, Arctic. 
Uh, not only, so Keeling's work actually inspired other uh, groups worldwide, including NOAA uh, and, uh, uh, and in Europe. And summarized here is this network of surface tower uh, aircraft and other data sets that are now available. So we know a lot about the, the carbon uh, behavior in the atmosphere via observations. And on the right is the record uh, collected by, by, by uh, extending the Keeling's curve to other sites by NOAA. And you can clearly see uh, here I've shown Barrow, which is in the Arctic, in the blue, and Mauna Loa in the red, and other sites, Samoa and South Pole. But you can clearly see that the seasonal cycle uh, in high latitude uh, Barrow is larger than the lower latitude sites. And, and I will talk a little bit about changing in trends in this seasonal cycle uh, that, that, that teaches a lot about uh, carbon coupling, uh, carbon climate couplings. Uh, Again, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of work by a lot of many people, but the greenhouse gas suit of greenhouse gas monitored has expanded. And on the top, I've listed the measured greenhouse gases that all contribute to radiative forcing, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, methane, N2O, CFCs, HCFCs. CFCs and HCFCs are, are in red because they were banned because they deplete the ozone layer, but they're also very potent greenhouse gases. This GWP is called the global warming potential. It is the uh, relative to uh, CO2, how effective this other gas is to uh, in, in, in radiative forcing. So methane is 28 times, N2O, CFCs and HCFCs are 100 to 1000 times more potent than, than CO2. So you don't need a lot of them, uh, uh, you, know, you don't need PPM, but PPB levels uh, uh, can, can matter. So on the left, again, I show you the aggregated uh, scripts, NOAA, Cicero, Australia, Europe curves of the increase in CO2, the increase in methane, uh, the increase in N2O, but also in the middle, I've added these very potent greenhouse gases, these uh, CFCs and the hydrochlorofluorocarbons. And as you can see, uh, the red is highlighted the Montreal Protocol signature in, in 80, uh, 87. And you can see on the right is kind of data afterwards uh, you know, and also estimations. And you can see after the Montreal Protocol, the ozone depleted halocarbons stopped rising and began to fall. So I think that's an important, important co-benefit of controlling, uh, uh, you know, the ozone uh, depleting substances. Uh, you know, I showed you all the greenhouse gases. You can add them all up. And uh, IPCC over the, since 19, uh, 7, 1750, to now, and then you could do radiative transfer models, both since the molecular properties of these gases are pretty well known. You also have a good atmospheric model and you can derive with good confidence and the uncertainty zone, the radiative forcing of various co components. CO2 is the big gorilla. It's forcing is about 2.2 watt per meter square. That has contributed on the right to about one degree C warming. So these are speciated warmings. I have put CFCs uh, in, in bold because they have actually forced about 0.2 watt per meter square, but warmed about 0.1 C. And this is after the Montreal uh, protocol. So if we hadn't done that, I will show uh, it would have been a lot worse. And then I do want to mention that there are um, you know, aerosols that I also study uh, have cooled the atmosphere. So air pollution uh, for independent reason for human health is, is and should go away. And that will increase the radiator forcing because they mass some of the, 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 the warm, warming by the greenhouse gases. Uh, so to focus on the CFCs, uh, the Montreal Protocol obviously reduced the CFCs uh, uh, as I showed below. And here is a, is, a, is a recent analysis that shows that this is a model analysis uh, informed by measurements, uh, but you can see in the right in the orange curve, what would have happened to temperatures if we hadn't controlled the, the, the CFCs? And you can see is without controls in 2100, we would be hitting a, a, you know, a more than six degrees warming, not just from the greenhouse gases, but also from these uh, uh, CFC and, and, and ecosystem feedbacks. So the CFC directly, because they would have gone up, contribute to about 1.7 uh, degrees Kelvin additional forcing and what's more important, in addition to the warming by CFCs, they would have depleted ozone that would have included, uh, enhanced UV uh, that would actually damage plants. And that's a carbon cycle feedback. And that is responsible to about 0.85 uh, K additional warming. So again, uh, without, uh, without the Montreal Protocol, 
there would have been much more carbon in the atmosphere. There have been uh, much less terrestrial carbon storage and the world would have been uh, 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 two to three degrees warmer, uh, even with the growing uh, the greenhouse gases. Uh, you know, I talked about surface measurements uh, uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Keeling uh, started uh, and got expanded to others, but there's also been uh, developments in, in uh, other modes of measurements and technologies uh, that we have participated in. This is actually this uh, global total column uh, uh, carbon observations network. It's called TCON, started by Professor Wenberg at Caltech in 2004. And I'm cartooning uh, how it works. And how do we kind of emulate uh, 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 Dr. Keeling's desire for very precise measurements? In this case, uh, these are total column, higher, larger scale measurements. So what we have here is a solar spectrometer. This is a, 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 a spectrometer that looks directly at the sun. There's a sun tracker. And the sunlight is actually measured in the near infrared uh, uh, with the Fourier transform spectrometer at high resolution and, and with very stringent protocols. Uh, since the spectra in the near infrared contains a, a lot of these uh, molecular gases like CO2, N2O, CO, methane, water, CO, and HF, all of these have unique uh, features uh, we select the bands where there's no interference with water and uh, amongst them, and we use these clean spectra to retrieve the total column um, uh, concentration. Now, there's another step to get high precision, and that is, as I said, there are in-situ measurements uh, that are tied to a WMO standard. So each of these sites has regular uh, aircraft profiles where we go up and then measure the total column. And, and so it's calibrated to the WMO standard, uh, you know, so, you know uh, so that it can maintain and not drift. Uh, now this TCON is actually then used to uh, calibrate uh, uh, satellites. I'll talk about it a little bit. So uh, the, the precision that TCON is better than uh, one PPM for CO2 and better than five PPB for CH4 in the total column. And the footprint of these measurements are, you know, a few kilometers. Uh, here is actually a summary of the data collected by TCON, and there are about 30 to 31 stations, past and ongoing. And, and on the left is the median plot of XCO2. I call this the TCON Keeling curve. So you can clearly see, uh, and all the sites are listed, you can see that the trend is clear. Uh, it's similar to uh, what in situ surface data shows. And it also shows the variability. Different colors are different latitude sites, and the high latitude sites have more higher seasonal uh, cycle uh, than the others as expected. On the right is just a heat map uh, to show you uh, from 2004 to 2020, how this network, which is spread all over the world, uh, from Europe to Australia, to, to America, uh, 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 to Korea, let's uh, that, uh, uh, that see. So on the top is the CO2 heat map, and you can clearly see the uh, large increase in CO2 uh, uh, from 2004 to 2020. Uh, and methane has gone up too. And CO is a marker of pollution and fires, and that has uh, interannual variability and, and, and changes. It's shorter lived, so it doesn't have a clear trend. Uh, just to add, I'm uh, now showing the scaling curve as seen from space. And so there's been the satellite era that began in 2003, roughly, and the data, this is actually NASA, JAXA, NOAA, and ESA data from global um, uh, uh, and on the left is the CO2, and on the right is methane. So you again see the same Keeling curve for CO2. You also see uh, a seasonal cycle in methane uh, because of sources and also the uh, sink varies. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so essentially, we're seeing the Keeling curve from in situ to total column to globally. The advantage of satellites is they don't measure all the time. They have to be tight and precise but they do have global co coverage. So they give you a, a, an eye into some other patterns, regional patterns that otherwise in situ network uh, are unable to see. So let me first focus on the first finding uh, in the modern, uh, how warming has affected uh, the carbon cycle. Uh, and this is again a function, uh, this shows seasonal cycle amplitude uh, as a function for two latitudes and time. Um, and here I will talk about the thermal fertilization effects uh, that has been seen in the last decade. So on the top panel is the seasonal cycle at Barrow, which I said is uh, uh, in Alaska, Arctic site, and then Mauna Loa. So that clearly the, the seasonal cycle in, in Barrow is larger than Mauna Loa, uh, but they both show an increase. They have both increased from the 60s up to the 20 in a steady manner. 
And this increase is essentially due to the fact that high latitude forests have warmed. They have warmed and the, and the growing season has increased. So, so uh, that results in more uh, you know, growth uh, and this, this is called the fertilization effect. So this is now, uh, uh, you know, Ralph uh, uh, has a paper that uh, discovered this and it was followed up by actually Lou et al that looked at OCO2 data. So, so it's, this fertilization is seen both by uh, in, in records like, like Healing's records, but also in satellite data sets. Here is again, I wanna illustrate that we're seeing uh, the GOSAT, which is a Japanese satellite uh, that uh, 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 here uh, we're showing uh, the, the, the GOSAT seasonal cycle mean trends across latitude. In the blacks is the COSAT, which was calibrated by TCON, derived uh, 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 seasonal cycle trends. And you can see as you go from low latitudes on the left to high latitudes, your seasonal cycle increases. And obviously there's a blimp and there's obviously an interaction between ecosystems and dynamics. And uh, on the colors are models. Clearly some models uh, uh, do uh, better than others. But essentially, this data set is, is, provides us a means to use seasonal cycle information to refine uh, models. Finally, uh, since we're talking about OCO2 recently, and this is a uh, work from the OCO2 science team, uh, we're beginning to see uh, OCO2 is very precise because it's been tied to TCON data. And it's able to match, as I'm showing in the, in the bottom, the seasonal cycle observed by TCON. And you can see very good agreement and on the top is just a summary of OCO2 seasonal cycle versus TCON seasonal cycle. They agree pretty much well to within half a ppm. GOSAT was about one ppm seasonal cycle agreement. When you take differences, things cancel out in the same region. And, and here I'm showing you the plot of OCO2 versus TCON SCA on, on the top. And again, the higher latitudes are the higher seasonal cycle uh, things. So I think the seasonal cycle information is already teaching you how the carbon cycle is responding uh, to the, the warming at, high, 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 uh, at higher northern latitudes. Uh, I would be very quick here. Uh, the OCO2 also sees uh, longitudinal patterns. For example, uh, when you have uh, El Nino, uh, La Nina in 2015-16, that results in changes in ocean circulation as shown on the left. And you can get uh, the, the outgassing of CO2 shifts because of the change circulation. So on the right is kind of an OCO sees the increase in CO2 uh, after the El Nino as shown in the red panel and, and cartoon below. And this is uh, verified by uh, ocean uh, pressure CO2, delta P CO2 measurements, in situ measurements. So again, satellites are beginning to discern with some detailed diagnostics not just correlations, but actually mechanisms where you can see on the left what the, the transport mechanisms are because the ocean is still complicated and undersampled. But this data set really allows us to uh, dissect the mechanisms and connect the models to the data. And, and again, satellites are the only way that we can see these features. I will be very quick here, but as I said, uh, there's CO2 that has been measured, but there's uh, uh, Dr. Keeling also started the first 13 CO2 measurements and analysis. So CO2 actually, uh, there are many sources and there are many sinks, and each of these has different signatures. I think everybody is aware of the radiocarbon signature for C14 that's well developed and that's used to constrain the anthropogenic uh, increase independently. Uh, there's also 13 CO2, and you can see the 13 CO2 has declined, uh, and that's because fossil contributions have increased. But I will focus a little bit more on the oxygen trend, and that is because when you burn or you respire, you have a chemical reaction, and that reaction results in a, for increase in CO2, you have a decline in O2. That stoichiometry is a very nice signature of the sources, the ocean actually does not take up O2, so it can be used to separate the um, oceanic SARS from these O2, from these biogenic and fossil sources. And, uh, and, and Ralph Keeling, Dr. Keeling's son, uh, really took over the O2 measurements. This is his data, and you can see how clearly uh, the uh, O2 trends uh, kind of follow inversely the CO2 trends because of this respiration combustion relationship. Now, again, note the, the O2N2 changes are in units of per meg. 
and not parts per million. So it's really hard to measure these small changes in O2, but we can do them just like we can do large scale satellite measurements. So, so advances in really measurements allow us to really uh, say a lot more about the carbon cycle and the climate uh, feedbacks. Let me give you a quick summary. We have a lot of data, so how do we feed them into models uh, and get some insights uh, or numbers that are policy relevant? And so the way it works is on the left, you do the best as you can. You either have a model or you have an inventory. Uh, and on the top is a uh, you know, global inventory of CO2 from various sources. You can see where people live, where people fly. So this is now well done and uh, well done and it's exercise we report. So we have emissions. We also have ecosystem and ocean models that have been tested at fine scale. So they allow us to build a prior flux. Then we have global and regional transport models uh, that are run and there are many of these, many flavors, different groups. And then finally on the right, we have surface satellite and aircraft observations uh, from many campaigns. And what we do is uh, we use uh, the prior fluxes to put into transport model. Uh, then we check the predictions of forward model with the observations. And then whatever parameter we don't have confidence, in this case, it may be regional ecosystem fluxes, we adjust them uh, to match the observations. So we call them optimized fluxes. And this is the kind of exercise that meets national attribution, regional attribution, and again, if you have signatures that adds to this value uh, and you can also do empirical top-down constraints. So what have we learned? And here's a, a summary of what we've learned of the global uh, carbon cycle. So uh, the plot shows the evolution of the fossil emissions that we know relatively well, the changes in land use change that are less well known, but we know that's the positive. We measure the atmospheric accumulation pretty well because of keeling uh, and other measurements. Uh, and then uh, we infer land uptake and ocean, either by signatures or by inverse modeling. So basically, uh, we have emitted over the last decade or so about 9.4 gigatons of carbon and about 1.6 gigatons from land use change, which is more uncertain. Of that emissions, about half have gone back into the biosphere and ocean. About 3.4 gigaton went into the biosphere uh, plants and about 2.5 went into the ocean, and about 5.1, which is very confident, it remains in the atmosphere. So that's the Keeling curve. So we can begin to partition these things globally and, uh, and, and regionally. Uh, there are some gap areas. I'll shift a little bit to, to, to my uh, effort. And one of the gap areas where there's lit, uh, little data, and, and it's very important, is the, uh, uh, is the regional carbon climate feedback in the Amazon. And as you know, the Amazon stores about 150 to 200 petagons of carbon. It cycles a lot of carbon. There's many CO2 sources. There's few data. So in 2014, we took our PECON station that I told you is part of the network to Amazon to kind of probe this in the wet part in the north near Manaus in a place called Manakukuru for a whole year. Now, uh, there's uh, papers uh, on, on the carbon cycle uh, in the Amazon. And I'm giving you one example. It was recognized that the carbon balance in the Amazon shifts from source, CO2 source to sink uh, as, as, as you go from a dry to wet years, respectively. So uh, I think this is show, shown here, and I'm just cartooning uh, the re results here. So this was our motivation. Uh, and so we probed the carbon cycle and, and try to evaluate how models do and what's changing. This is a seasonal data set we collected in Manaus in 2014-15. And on the top, uh, it's a lot of data. And this is a, a single station measuring the same column every day for a year, almost. And on the top, you can see the precipitation and the moisture, the water, the column water. And you can clearly see the seasonality, dry, wet, dry. So you have dry seasons, wet seasons, dry seasons. That's the seasonality that drives ecology in the tropics. Uh, you can also see that during the dry seasons, you have fires and carbon monoxide is a signature for fire. So you have higher uh, carbon dioxide during the fire seasons. Uh, if you look at nitrous oxide and uh, CO uh, and, and methane, you can see that they're generally high during the wet season, as you would expect from uh, the wetlands and the, the more moisture in the land. Uh, the last is the CO2, which has a lot of confounding uh, effects. And so that needs a little bit more uh, result to analyze. And I'll try to run you through that analysis. How do we separate that CO2 
into various contributions. So let me start uh, uh, to run you through this analysis. It's a little bit complex, but let me run through this arithmetic. So what I showed you, the TCON data is in red. So we take start with the red raw data. Then we subtract the, the CO2 trends that we know independently and from there. Uh, and that gives you the blue, blue curve. Then we also know that there is a biomass burning signal. And we use the CO to derive the green curve, which is the biomass burning curve. And then when you correct for that, those two independent processes, you get the black curve. The black curve is kind of the rainforest response, but includes both the biogenic local response of the response, but also the transport. So where CO2 came from longer range, including the longer hemisphere. We subtract that transport term with a model, like a carbon tractor putting a mass. And we finally conclude that the biogenic flux of the local ecosystem is of the order of 2.5 ppm. So that's the diurnal, uh, the, the biogenic seasonal cycle, not diurnal, but the seasonal cycle for the biogenic uh, uh, in the rainforest. So that's a new finding uh, uh, that, uh, that, that is important to, uh, to evaluate models. Uh, what we also did was we compared the big activity uh, that uh, a multi-model activity where uh, there are many models that ran through the global carbon cycle for OCO2. Um, and what we compared the model output with our observations uh, at Manaus. The black is the data and uh, the colors are various models. What you can see clearly is five of the seven carbon transport models of various flavors observe the CO2 you know, transport and, and biology pretty well. Uh, two do, uh, do, uh, do not work very well, we understand why. And the trend is obviously uh, captured. Uh, but we still can't uh, dis disentangle this transport versus uh, local uh, effects. To add to that story, uh, let me, we had daily data. So every day in the rainforest, I talked to you about yearly seasonal cycle, but now we have daily data over a year. And so on the right, I'm showing you the changes in CO2 every day and the PDF for that. Every morning over the rainforest, the total column CO2 is high because of nighttime respiration. As the gay, day go, progresses, photosynthesis kicks in and your CO2 in the total column uh, drops. And so you can see in the green is there is a large drawdown from CO2 with a mean of around minus two ppm, so it, it drops. And on the colors are the model predictions of all the models. And you can see the TCON measures a mean daily drawdown of about minus 2.1 ppm, which is four times greater than any model. So essentially what that tells you is the partitioning between the respiration and photosynthesis uh, is not right in the models that we're able to match the seasonal variation. And this begs the question, uh, you know, to do a better job at photosynthesis because it will matter in projections uh, of uh, future warmer worlds of the tropics. And let me switch very quickly to methane. And I'll just highlight a few results. Uh, here I'm showing you a curve for uh, methane rise. Uh, methane is complex, many sources, uh, the OH sink. Um, and you can see it, it, it plateaued in the, it stopped rising in the mid 2000s, but recently it has uh, undergone a pretty uh, record-breaking rise over the last two years. And one of the ideas is to, uh, one of the priorities is to reduce methane because it's a potent short-lived greenhouse gas. It's also a commodity. So you can gain confidence and actually slow down the rate of warming before you transition to, to CO2. I am gonna run this very quickly, but uh, methane has a lot of sources, natural and anthropogenic, and within anthropogenic, it has fossil fuels, food, ruminants, ruminants and, and, and waste decomposition. So it's a complex uh, uh, soup, but uh, you know, we are targeting oil and gas because that is a place where a lot of methane does come up and it's a commodity. So I think uh, uh, you know, and its, it's near-term global warming potential is about 84 times CO2. Uh, here, I actually want to quickly highlight some work we did at Four Corners with the satellite people. On the right, I'm showing you the methane hotspot that the Skymaki saw in a very mean sense from 2003 to 2009. And you can see the methane enhancements pretty clearly. Uh, we also had our TCON station that gives you very high resolution time resolved measurements. And those seasonal, uh, those daily signals are shown on the left. You can clearly see if you average the data that methane at our site at the center of this hotspot 
clearly rose in the morning uh, by about 50 ppm, ppb. And this is a coupling of transport and, and dynamics at our site. On the middle panel, I'm showing you what you would expect with a model that captures the meteorology of the region. The model with Edgar emissions, which is the bottom-up inventory, sh show you a lot less enhancement, a factor of 3.5. So we infer from our top-down measurements that the emissions were too low by a factor of 3.5. And that implied that the emissions at four corners were about 590 gigagrams of carbon per year. And um, uh, fortunately or effectively, uh, after our paper, EPA revised that uh, inventory. So the science does feel, feel policy if it's done right uh, in a timely manner. Uh, I will now switch very quickly to the dairies in California, which also shown here is this is the inventory for California where dairy emissions dominate uh, in the, in the uh, Tulare area and 80% uh, uh, are from dairy industry in that region. And the emissions are uncertain. And, and again, uh, California has aggressive, aggressive reduction policies. So it's important uh, to, uh, to uh, quantify them. Here, we actually have a portable version of the TCON. So these are smaller TCON versions, less precise, but calibrated, uh, but stable. And, and we deployed four of these uh, around the site uh, at, at many tens of kilometer scale. And the idea really was to take these gradient measurements of difference up and downwind and, and use a wharf model uh, with stilts to actually uh, do optimizations. So the finding here is a little bit more scientific is our top-down emissions compared with what was reported. They're generally in agreement with other reports. However, uh, there is a new finding, which means that we find that the winter emissions, we went all four seasons only only a short time, so our sampling is not uh, very extensive. This probes more study. But essentially, we see similar uh, winter and summer time emissions, whereas you would expect, because of temperature, uh, summer emissions of methane from you know, uh, uh, cow manure and others would be, break, uh, would be bigger. But it's not the case, and we suspect it's uh, the moisture effect that shows up in the uh, uh, winter uh, emissions at low temperatures being uh, uh, you know, as much as the summer. And this needs further uh, uh, interrogation. Lastly, I will show you an attempt uh, by the OCO uh, science team and the modelers in a recent paper that again, using these inverse models um, uh, and OCO data to partition regionally. I showed you the global carbon cycle. Now they're trying to partition at a national level, the first attempt of the inventory. And the results are shown on the left. So for example, on the top is the emissions. And on the bottom is the sinks from the, uh, from the terrestrial sinks. You can see for the emissions, uh, the reported and the inferred are pretty similar. Uh, but on the, on the sink, on the ecosystem sink, you can clearly see that uh, Europe, uh, uh, the, uh, what it reports, uh, what, what we measure is bigger than what we report. Uh, they're both negative for USA. And the summary on the right shows that the Annex One countries, which includes the uh, developed world, uh, are better managing their, their, their ecosystems and their food. And so the ecosystem six are greater than reported and, the, and they are better for EU than US. On the right, there's, it points to the fact that non-NX ecosystems where, where we need to do more work in the uh, countries, uh, they are a CO2 source, they have uncertainties. And here again, we have opportunity for better uh, management to, to reduce this. Finally, I will let, close uh, with uh, quickly covering, uh, looking at the future. And this comes back to the 2005 uh, Chapman conference that uh, Dr. Keeling and, and many of us uh, talked about this and he was there. And uh, you know, right now, uh, DOE uh, and, and, and the US government and, and Europe are envisioning uh, earth shots where we actually remove carbon dioxide aggressively from the atmosphere by a variety of techniques. And they are highlighted here, it could include CO2 capture from power plants, from direct air, and then storage. Put it back where it came from, or promote uh, ocean sinks, or to promote uh, terrestrial sinks. Different nations will do it, there are different technologies. And again, it's important to make sure that all of these technologies are verifiable in the light that we already expect some natural feedbacks to kick in. So, the, the case to monitor, monitor the future is, is more important now than ever. Here I'm just articulating this RP, the IPCC SSP 1 2.6 watt per meter square sustainability scenario, which is a very aggressive scenario to basically keep our warming to less than 
two or one and a half degrees. And what it envisions is uh, basically gradually ramping down CO2 um, and then going to CO2 negative emissions in the, uh, in the intermediary uh, and, and basically stabilizing both temperatures and reducing uh, atmospheric CO2 from peak values of 460 that I expected uh, to, to, to even uh, below uh, values today. So what happens there is I think uh, we need the technologies that Keeling started and, uh, and Ralph, I, and others have developed, meaning try to look within uh, the source and uh, uh, CO2 signatures that I talked about. And one, uh, uh, one uh, signature is this oxygen and CO2. Uh, on the left-hand panel, uh, as I've uh, showed, is, is some results from simulations informed by measurements at a CO2 uh, capture plant at a Siberian field site. And here again, uh, noteworthy is when you capture CO2 and sequester it underground, this CO2 has no oxygen. Oxygen, oxygen. It's on land. It's kind of like the ocean sink. That's already helped us quantify it. So as you can see, is if you have a leak, uh, you can clearly see uh, these plant emissions will show out from the natural uh, background. Uh, that's because it has no uh, 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 O2, the, the leak CO2. On the right-hand side is the various IPCC pathways to uh, stabilize or baseline scenarios uh, are not CO2. And the black is the baseline scenario. Uh, the red is the carbon capture and storage kind of related to the left. So when you go to the red line, you, you're at lower CO2, but you also uh, uh, you know, have uh, less oxygen so that pathway is clearly, so as if you measure global O2, CO2, you can keep monitoring very intelligently progress towards this pathway. So again, this paradigm allows us to uh, look forward and probe the earth as we try to heal it, uh, you know, as it's responding to our perturbations. Again, I'll stress that uh, independent of sequestration, the fact that we don't know when and, uh, and uh, as the Arctic warms, if some of the CO2 or methane will come out, this underscores the reason to, uh, to, to measure, uh, measure the carbon cycle even better. Uh, I will close here uh, with just an IPCC summary uh, that says changes are observed throughout the climate system. Our ability to decarbonize at scales determines our future. Progress is being made, but we need to accelerate and scale. And on the right, I'm just showing you the various uh, IPCC pathways. On the left, I'm saying you what is already known, CO2 has gone up, precipitation has changed, Glacier mass, there's evidence of glacier mass loss. Uh, temperatures have increased, sea level is rising. Ocean heat content, is, there's a lot of heat traps. So there is a lot of uh, you know, change in the pipeline. Again, global warming pro projections, we'd like to be in the blue range and that's where CCS and renewable energy and reduced emissions and efficiency comes in. Uh, the, the, the radiative forcing is, you know, we wanna go back to you know, what, you know, two watt per meter square or less. And we're headed to you know, 10, 10 watt per meter square. And so it's important to uh, monitor as we are, we don't quite know exactly what tipping points will exceed in the carbon climate feedbacks. Uh, I think I will close here by just acknowledging a lot of my uh, collaborate, my students, postdocs, LAML collaborators and external collaborators. On the green are people who've actively contributed to the greenhouse gas work I've done. And I must say a lot of these two, what, what is most significant, just like uh, Dr. Keeling has done is train the students. So a lot of the work I presented on the TCON was done by students, uh, undergraduate students, who are post undergraduates. Many of them have PhDs now and are pursuing careers. And, and the right are people I do aerosol work. Uh, and again, this is Earth Week, so I hope uh, this uh, talk uh, uh, conveys some of the facts that we know to climate, some of the acts that we need to take, and also a sense of optimism that, that the administration has created, that we can do it. It's a matter of scaling economics and policy. The science is settled. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dubey. It was quite an enlightening talk, and I'll just open the floor for the questions and answers. Please feel free to add uh, your comments or question and answer to the question and answer box. Thank you. So there is a question from one of the audience that on slide 37, which data set represent leaks of sequestered CO2? Uh, slide 37? Yeah. Yeah, so slide 37 is 
uh, is a, yeah, it's, there is no real measurement. So this is a simulation of both uh, measurements are from just ecology and the simulation is captured what would happen if the leaks occurred. So what this shows is that there's a natural uh, variability, but uh, clearly the steep line is if you process plant emissions, uh, you can uh, capture the leak. So this is not a leak data, but this is a baseline. This is from a, a paper uh, on the Otway Basin. There's a model that's devoted to leak detection and dedicated. So this is more a uh, model than data. Great. Um, questions? So, Dr. Dubey, I have a one very basic and quick question about the Paris Agreement. Based on your studies measuring the data for methane, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases, as well as understanding the modelings of future CO2 concentrations and radiative forcing, what are your thoughts about accomplishing the goal of Paris Agreement? How confident or how pessimistic you are about that goal? Let me step back a little bit. So I tried to, uh, maybe I'll just connect with you know, this recent paper by Bern et al. I mean, A, you have to have agreements. I mean, CO2 is accumulative. So the forcing is from cumulative. So when you add the West uh, or China or India, you, you know, the cumulative emissions are pretty large for the US and increasing for China. So I think that is an agreement that has to be accounted for somehow. Uh, so I, I, I'm optimistic that the West can do a good job with technology advancements and good things are already happening in terms of energy efficiency, renewables. So the emissions are decreasing without, you know, an intensity, carbon intensity is increasing. I think in the earlier agreements, uh, bio, uh, you know, biological needs, reforestation, all these things uh, were to create a big rule. Uh, and I think that helped the, the developing world a little bit more because there is a lot of opportunity there. However, it has to be done right. And again, here, doing it right and assuring, uh, you know, that this permanence of the carbon sequestered biologically or underground is important. So I think that's where the agreement will happen. As I said, uh, as, say here, there's room for increasing in a measured manner the uh, sinks from the, um, you know, from uh, the developing world, right? So better managing of ecosystems in a, in a measured manner. I think there has to be some leapfrogging, meaning some technology transfer uh, in renewables, uh, which is happening uh, in, 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 and solar has to occur. So I think this framework has to be global I do know, I'm from India, I do know that what's driving India and it drove China a decade ago is air pollution. So I think by reducing air pollution, they have advanced energy technologies and they have appreciated the value of this. And I think uh, if in India, uh, there's conversions to electric, uh, you know, uh, scooters or electric autos, and then there's at least a vision of you know, carbon-free energy sources to power them. I think that's the way to go. And, and, and I, I'll just say, I'm not being, I think this already happened in cell phones, right? Mobile phones were easily, so that transformation of the information age already happened in India worldwide, you know, and clothes and wearing. But, uh, you know, I think it hasn't happened. It needs to happen. I don't have a path. It needs to happen in, at these scales in energy, decarbonization. I don't know if I answered your question. I, I'm optimistic, but it needs work, both sides, and trying to, you know, and I think India is appreciating the benefits. And as the middle class advances, they, they value air quality, right? Nobody wants to breathe that, you know. So as the level of income rises uh, and, and reaches levels that are concomitant with quality of life as ours, things will happen. But I think you, the West has to take uh, initiative and it has to be a global commons sharing of technologies, uh, et cetera. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so let me read uh, one question from uh, the audience. Um, Steve Schwartz have asked the question, given transport, 
Do you anticipate that it would be possible to quantify leaks of carbon dioxide sequestration from either CO2 measurements or from measurements of CO2 and O2 slash N2O? So uh, I, I think his question is focused on transportation. Right. Okay. Should I read it again? Please. Or you can the first open? part. First so part. you can also look at it in question yeah, analysis. Yeah, and question. Yeah, there you go. I'll sleep. Yeah. Thanks, to Steve. I know his questions are always in. Okay. Given transport, do you anticipate that it would be possible to quantify leaks of CO from either CO two measures or from? Yeah, oh, he's talking about atmospheric transport. Thank you. So he's talking about mixing. So Steve, as you know, uh, oxygen and CO2 are very long lived. So I think these features, and that's the left-hand side, I think the O2 to N2 signature, uh, the CO2 and Delta o O2 signature will be preserved in the source. So uh, at least in the near field, and I think even in global scale. So, uh, you know, if on global scale, you have all these uh, sequestration sites, and you know some of them fail or for whatever reason uh, and you don't measure or some country doesn't report and it's big enough, you will pick these signals up. And the analogy is like CFCs. You know, the Montreal Protocol has resulted in some CFCs uh, being underreported and people pick it up downwind. So this is analogous to that. Uh, I think the transport signal, it, since the lifetimes of both these gases are pretty long, uh, the signal will be preserved. Now, tracing it back to the source uh, is challenging, but I think it's possible if you know you know the sites, you know the locations. So I think it's doable, is my take. But again, we need to envision, and I, I think there are, there needs to be effort to put these technologies in place to start monitoring. Okay, um, if there is no questions, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Dubey once more. Um, and also um, for your enlight en enlightening presentation. With our greatest um, appreciation, I hereby present Dr. Dubey this uh, flag to you on behalf of the Department of Atmospheric Sciences. Can you see this? Thank you. Um, yes, okay. it's a little bit out of focus, but unfortunately, uh, this is I'm honored. Yeah, I'm honored. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's it's on behalf of the Department of Atmospheric Sciences and Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment, uh, which will be mailed to you soon. Thank you again, Dr. Dubey, and also thanks everyone to attend this uh, talk. There is Thank one you. more question that popped up, maybe in the okay. screen. Yeah. And the question is from Sudhan Shurat, is the Montreal CFC ban restricted the rise in world temperatures? Please go ahead. From CO2 and CH4, what is now contributing and needs action? I think it's the, it's the CO2 and methane. I think they need uh, actions. I think we have a framework for CFCs. We're doing well, but trying to do, uh, and we've done well, I think trying to um, uh, focus on CO2 and methane is important. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Sudhan Shurat.